Um, so since it's been three years since I talked to the LCA, um, they accepted my talk this year, and so I have three years worth, which is 150 slides. Since we only have a 20-minute slide slot here, it's perfect. But it's actually going to be a yeah, go. It's going to be a, just a very quick overview of the talk I'm giving on Thursday. Uh, that and this bit is really uh, about uh, the previous. Um, yeah, I'll skip to go with this. Um, so yeah, give up on electronics because electronics is hard. Basically, the previous LCAs we had. So I'll just focus on that. Uh, you'll get a teaser of the rest, and then I can go back. Um, actually, that might be slightly. No, no, I'll keep that for Thursday. You should just show up on Thursday. Um, let's go back here. There we go. So this is about the uh, history of the LCA uh, Arduino MiniConf, now the Open Hardware uh, MiniConf. So um, because of a bad person, I used to skip the first two days of the LCA um, to go do cool things in whatever city it was in. But now I've seen every Australian city at least twice. so. I uh, didn't have to do that as much. And I missed the first one in 2010, Pebble V1, but I got it after the fact. And that was my introduction to playing with Arduino. It was quite cool. Um, actually, yeah, at the end, there's a lot of URLs in this talk. Um, at the end, you can take a picture of the slide that gives you the link, so you can have all the links. Or actually, I can do it very quickly right now. If you just get this link down there, uh, take a picture, one, two, three, and it's gone. Okay, so uh, anyway, so you, you can get all the, I'll put it at the end. But um, the first um, board we had was a basic input output board. They had uh, relays, buttons, potential meters. Um, you even had a radio board, and that's the link to the first one, uh, the first um, page. That's what it looked like. So I got it after the fact. Uh, I went on a diving trip, and between dives I was quite bored. So I started working on it, and it was uh, quite fun. So that's the first one. And you can see there's a little slot here for a wireless radio, which I got later, so I could talk to it from my laptop without having a wire in between. Uh, 2011, next year, Mops and Dat. So Mops and Dat, uh, I have a picture here. Um, it had slots for two radios. Um, that one was a long range uh, radio. That was a short range XB module. Uh, that was some Freetronics company. I've never heard of it. I'm not sure what they do. Um, and uh, it had the weird shape that was designed to go in a rocket. That was, that's why it was longer than wide. Um, and it had a GPS slot. I made a very, I don't know why I got that connector at home somehow, but I got that connector so I could unplug the, um, the GPS because I ended up not using it for, uh, I wanted to put it in an RC plane, but by the time I was ready to do it, a Trich had already done all the work and I didn't really need to put that on an RC plane. But anyway, um, I'm sorry for speaking quickly, but a lot of material. So um, they had SD cards to record data. You could get uh, altimeter settings, GPS, um, accelerometer. It was quite cool, but I just never built a rocket because I didn't sign up in time and I'm not cool enough to go to space. So my uh, rocket, sorry, my mobs and that uh, never went in space or anywhere in the air even. But it got to do, it got to do cool things. Um, that was my first little cool Arduino board that at the time, I know it looks huge today, but uh, at the time it was the smallest Arduino board I could get compared to the ones you would buy that were even bigger. And it had all those things already wired in. So it was like, cool, I can maybe use this to do other, other stuff. And I was looking at um, sleep monitoring at the time. So I thought, hey, I can use this board. And there's more uh, slots on that. I have an entire talk that got rejected, but you have the link here. I did give it elsewhere, so I didn't just write it to get it not re uh, accepted. But that's, um, that's how you do sleep monitoring normally. It costs actually around $5,000 in the US. It's quite nice. Uh, the hotel room is not quite up to standards for 5,000 bucks, but the wiring is. Um, it, it does take about, seriously, it takes over half an hour to get wired with all this stuff. And at the end, they use some special, very uh, foul smelling stuff to get all the glue out of you. Quite fun. Also, they shave your legs for free. It's very nice. Um, <laughs> They are take at home. So this is the good, good stuff that actually works and records everything. Uh, when you go to sleep. So the problem sleeping, yeah, I was going to get to that. Sleeping, that's what the, the slide at the top says. Good luck sleeping with that, right? Uh, one of my problems, I don't sleep if I have any disturbance. And that turns out to be a small disturbance having all this crap on me, especially because I'm a belly sleeper. So sleeping on the belly with that did not work at all. Um, and then you also strangle yourself with all the wires. It just didn't work so well. Um, so there are take-at-home ones that work better because you don't have to pay the $5,000 um, and also you don't have to shave your legs, which is great. Uh, it doesn't record as many things, but it's good enough to get basic monitoring. 
But those things being medical instruments still cost way, way too much money. You can have your own. Like they made me drive back to download the data when like, you know, I had to show them how their own software works. So eventually the lady actually gave me the software so I could do it at home without driving every day to download the data at their office when they didn't even know how to do it anyway. Um, that's another version of it that's a little bit better. It doesn't have a nose cannula. They use some magic, I'm not sure how. There, there are two finger things. This one is the normal uh, pulse and uh, oximeter, which knows how much oxygen you have in your blood. The other one here, don't ask me how it works, it's supposed to measure your breathing through your finger through a different thing, which uh, nicely only works one night. So every night you have to throw it away, buy another one, they cost $100 a piece. Ooh, exactly. Um, so that's what it kind of looks like. Um, so I did use that, my insurance paid for it, my medical insurance that is, but I was like, hey, this is kind of crappy, as in not very nice. Uh, the, so it goes back to Bob's, uh, Bob's and that. So, like, hey, you know, what do I really need? Um, I need to have my breathing. I need to know my body position. So the interesting thing is if you have sleep apnea or uh, problems breathing, you sleep worse on your back because gravity pulls your tongue back when you're on your back. So you actually sleep better on your side, your, your tummy. So how long do you sleep on each side? Well, an accelerometer would do that just fine. Turns out I had a board ahead one, so that was a very good thing. Uh, I put an XB Pro on it, so it would send the data wirelessly to my computer during the night. Um, and that's what I ended up with. Um, I had the sleep positions for how long. I knew how many times I moved during the night, how many hours of sleep I had. Uh, I don't know, it actually know. I think I just turned it on and off so I knew when I started sleeping. So the hours of sleep is actually not based on me sleeping. Um, then I was like, okay, breathing. Well, breathing, you want airflow. So I found that airflow sensor. Uh, it's pretty cool, actually. It has a little heating element here and a thermistor next to it. So it's actually heating up the air and measuring the air temperature next to it. And when you blow air uh, across that uh, using airflow, it actually changes the temperature of the sensor. Uh, pretty nice. So I put a little tube connected to that. Then it looks like this. Uh, very nice. Uh, I also had two uh, Zio sensors. Um, one was uh, connected to my phone, the other one to a base station. That one actually is supposed to read your brain waves somehow and know whether you are in... Um, stage one, two, or three of sleep, or a REM sleep. That's the base station it talks to. It was a pretty cool device, um, but they didn't really find a way to make money long term, so they shut down, which is kind of sad. But that little thing, if you see the little blocks here, it shows you what stage of sleep you're on. It can show you, you know, how many times you cycle through it, and it actually knows whether you're sleeping or not. So, oh, the really cool thing is those people were awesome. They actually had a plug in the back that was FTDI, so I could actually get the data off it real time. So I got down my computer. Um, that's just very um, decoding of the airflow, uh, the position, and it shows me somewhere uh, what sleep, yeah, sleep state, state REM. So right now I just changed from whatever sleep state to a new one, um, and that gave me a fair amount of data. And now the biggest problem was the nose cannula getting the airflow. Um, I'm talking way too long about this because this is not going to do the 20 minutes. I'm just going to go through those slides. You have to come on Thursday, sorry. So basically, the airflow had issues. Then I had a stretch fabric that basically tried to that I put around my belly to see whether it would stretch enough or not. Um, that also had some issues. Um, yeah, I guess putting an entire 45-minute talk into a five-minute slot is not going to work. Uh, so there were problems. I put a bigger cap. You like the big capacitor, 10 farads. I thought it was going to do it, but not quite. It was a different issue. So I'll go there. Peak detection is trying to find the breathing, so each breath should be a peak. Um, there were also issues with that, but at least I got some data. I got 90% or 95%, but not enough to see problems. When you see problems, you need to know that those problems are real problems, not fake issues. So that's kind of where I give up. Um, and I also needed the SpO2 part, which shows you your blood saturation, and that I tried to make my own, and that was fiendishly difficult. So uh, I eventually gave up on that. Off the rails, uh, back to uh, Open Hardware Miniconf, Pebble V2. Show you a picture of Pebble V2. Um, very nice board with a four segment, uh, four line uh, LCD. Uh, you could write characters to it. There was a basic driver. Uh, actually, I'm getting ahead of my slides. So, anyway, that, that's the um, hardware it was based on. It was a newer version of the Pebble V1 with a nicer screen. And uh, there was a basic driver to talk to it to write basic characters, but as you see, I have a little a heart sign and a little, little guy here that were not part of those characters. So I found uh, another library called New Liquid Crystal, which was not set up for that, the wiring that we were using on that board, because we're using a shift register to save uh, pins. And that was my first time that I got con writing a driver for uh, 
uh, open hardware miniconf uh, device. And that was quite fun. I actually got to get, well, fun for the definition of fun. Uh, I got the uh, spec sheet, figure out what it needs, uh, what timing and so forth, got all the wiring, um, translation, and eventually got it to work. That was the end result. Uh, sorry for going fast. The next year was hack CNC. I'll show you a picture first. Uh, that's the pile of bits you get. And that is what looks like a printer, and it almost is, actually. It's uh, like a um, 2D printer which has a little pen that moves around. It can go up and down, and you can draw shapes with it. It almost would be a 3D printer, except it doesn't put out layers of goo that makes a 3D shape. It just has a pen. But it got very close to it and talked like uh, G-code like a 3D printer would. And that was a very nice device. It's also super great to put in your luggage on the way back because it fits very well. It was about year big. <laughs> and, uh, but I, yeah, I actually found someone to, to get, take it home for me, so it worked out. Um, and yeah, uh, G-Code. Uh, sadly, that's one project that I never really got to do much afterwards with because I had other things that, kept, uh, that took my time. Um, so... What happened is I had a little Arduino training course at work that was an optional class that I went to that just gave us a bunch of things. Uh, those were some Adafruit uh, sensors. And I thought, oh, yeah, Arduino, that was fun. It's better than doing a day of work, uh, which it sure was. So that was a nice little accelerometer. You had a little um, segment here. And as I was tilting the board, I would move the little snake, and I could not run off the screen. Otherwise, it died. Um, and that was really fun. So that was also my introduction to Adafruit GFX. Um, so Adafruit, whether they actually call NeoPixels right or wrong, uh, they actually have written a lot of libraries that are quite helpful. The GFX one is a very nice way to talk to multiple graphical backends, uh, from the uh, little 8x8 segment displays here to uh, lots of things that you're seeing here. And the idea is you use the same code with the same primitives, you just change the backend and it works. And that's a really cool thing about the library. So... That segment at the time only had green or, or, or red, and you could mix them to do orange, so you only got three colors. But it was a good start to get uh, playing with it. So I thought, hey, well, it's nice to have that segment display, but I'd like to have one in three colors. And sadly, that device actually did its own color mixing, so I couldn't uh, flip it quickly enough. So I thought, hey, how hard would it be to do my own? So I bought one of those, these guys that had, um, looks like this. Uh, that's a bicolor and that's a tricolor one. Um, and basically the way they work is you cannot uh, have one pin for each of the 64 LEDs, so you do a row scanning, and you select the one line here, so this line, and then while you select this line, you select which one of those pins are going to be on, and that's how you select, and you did it for red, blue, and green at once, and you can see there's three colors of blue, so you do that, and then you do it by flipping it, and if you flip it not too often it's light blue. If you flip it more often, it's red, it's dark blue. And if you mix the colors together, you get everything like that. Um, so the driver was a lot of work uh, because it's interrupt-driven. It has to be very fast. Um, here I selected four bits per color. Uh, they give me uh, 4,000 colors total. And it was basically at the edge of what an Arduino basic could do. Five minutes. Oh, my God, I'm so screwed. Thank you. Uh, sorry? Yeah, I speak faster, exactly. Um, but I got learned to do uh, in, uh, interpreting, um, something called binary code, code modulation, which basically, instead of flipping 16 times and turning on 15 out of 16 uh, of a same time T, you take, uh, if you say, hey, I need uh, 15 out of 16, you cut your T into two. So the first is a 40, which is four times longer. You leave that on. And then the next time you have an interrupt of 2t, and then the third time you have an interrupt of 1t. So by firing the interrupt only four times, but of a different length, you end up getting the mix of colors uh, that you need without actually with giving a bit more time uh, to your main code. All right, uh, 2014, we're making progress. Artiphone. Artiphone was in Perth. Um, I can't say how cool this thing was, really. It really, really was cool. Uh, except I had issues with mine that didn't quite work because of some issue that we never quite figured out. But, um, I mean, you had your own Arduino that could make phone calls and SMS. It looked very stylish. It was much better than my phone. I mean, can you imagine making phone calls with this? People would be envious. Um, I think I was already married by the time, but otherwise, seriously. Uh, <laughs> 
So, no, it was really great. The problems of mine didn't work, and by the time John was nice enough to fix it for me, um, the 2G network that it was working on didn't work anymore. Uh, that was quite sad. So it was a really good project, but you know, timing did not quite work out. All right, simple belt. Um, first Raspberry Pi, uh, first little robot. It was actually quite well made for like doing a cheap robot. Uh, I like the wheels, like cut and so forth, the zip ties. I mean, this is the perfect project, really. Um, I think I got the basic stuff working, but JavaScript is not much my thing. Uh, I don't want to like you know badmouth it because the idea C++ is also too complicated for many people. It just happens to be what I know. Um, and yeah, I never spent much time learning JavaScript, uh, but it was using Node.js, and it was an you know introduction to uh, robots for people who hadn't played with them. So uh, that was simple bot. Um, yeah, that one I'm going to have to skip. This is why I didn't do so much work. Uh, you'll have to come back for these guys. Uh, so again, see you on Thursday. Um, all right, ESP Plan 2016. So first ESP8266, that was the first 32-bit uh, CPU, quite powerful. Um, of course, it, need, if it needs to monitor the humidity and the temperature for your plants. It also needs to have an RG, uh, um, RGB uh, ring with colors because, because bling, I guess. So it's because I guess the bling was more important than the uh, plants. I spent a long time making that ring do nice colors. Um, and it's still said sitting in my garage otherwise. I never connected it to my plants, which is sad. But the uh, LED ring is working very well. Um, all right, that's 2017 now. Uh, yeah, that was my worst year ever, IOTAS. Uh, if you were here last year for my mini talk, uh, that was the first time we had an ESP32. Very nice uh, chip. It was very early on when it got released. Uh, the driver was still being written, and the paint was still drying when we received it. Um, so, and also the drivers were kind of missing. So at least most of them were. Um, so I got to port drivers. That was a very cool, enlightening experience. About 100 years, uh, 100 hours, not years, of, it felt like 100 years of hours later, um, I made what I thought was a really li nice library. Um, yeah, those were the nice people that I got conned by. I mean, look at them, they look so nice. Like, hey, here's a little board. It just needs a couple of things. It won't take too long. Um, so, yeah, so the, uh, the TFT kind of worked, but needed more drivers. Uh, touchscreen had, to had to be flipped because it was on a shared line. Um, rotary encoder, rotary encoders are the made of the, the thing of the devil. I mean, they look like little turning thing that can be so hard, but oh my God, getting this interrupt driven quite well are really hard actually. Uh, most people get it wrong. If you look on the internet, you'll find plenty of code that doesn't work right, or all it does is go in a tight loop and you can't do anything else at the same time. Uh, even the AOB buttons, you know, reading a button can be so hard, right? Uh, well, it can if you put them behind an IO expander. Uh, that makes your life a little bit harder. There's a joystick that needs to be calibrated. Uh, NeoPixels, oh my God, this is, that was the beginning of the end for me. It's like color LEDs, but they don't work like the other ones. And then it went to that, this stuff over there. Uh, accelerometer, temperature, humidity, IO expander, infrared. I also had to write the infrared driver. Um, so I got this working during the conf, which was no small feat. Uh, and then many, many hours after that. Uh, so I've got a menu system, uh, and again, Adafruit JFX came to the rescue, so you can use the same code and, and things between a big screen like that one and the small screens I had before. Um, that one user shook the board around and it would actually paint for you. Um, that was, uh, so my big thing is great programmers program, better programmers steal. I very much believe in that. Uh, so that was code from Adafruit that I was able to port. Um, I'm probably a better person to port code than to write it. Uh, so I ported a lot of code, actually. Um, then I got the RGB. So I actually got something in Adafruit GFX. I got them to put in a, a draw RGB bitmap function that was, had been missing for a long time. So you could write multicolor uh, whatever you wanted. And here I'm turning the little uh, rotary encoder to zoom the picture, sorry, zoom. Move it left and right using a hardware thing. Um, and as I said, I created, so I stole Tetris, and I also st stole uh, this, uh, what is it called, Breakout. Uh, it, it's not like it was no work, right? But I didn't have to write all the code, because I don't really need to be writing, writing another Breakout. So yeah, IOTAS, um, you seriously need to sell this board. You don't know how many people email me saying, oh my god, this is so great, I saw the videos, I have the code, where do I buy the board? Seriously, it was the best ESP32 board made, even today. Like the one being sold by Expressive is, no offense, it's sad in comparison. So, uh, but anyway, so I had to port my code to the W Rover board that is uh, lesser board, in my opinion, 
uh, but that some people had. So I ported it. I made a, a poor version of the IOTERS and I ported the code to it. Um, that was a small demo of that. And the NeoPixels, those little color LEDs. Um, so once I had to write a driver to make it work on ESP32 and I understood how they worked, I was like, oh, this is kind of cool. And then you can make a string of them, right? Um, so, right. So that was a year and a half of my life that went down the drain after that. So there's a, once you put a little line, if you put multiple lines, you get the matrix, right? So that's what you have. I guess those things are not still running. They haven't crashed yet. Yep. So that's the matrix here of a 3232. Um, so wiring, actually probably have a slightly better picture here. Yeah, so when you are really stupid, you take those things and you glue them together and you make a matrix like that. That was 24, 24, about a day of work. Um, if you're smarter, uh, you actually buy matrices now which were pre-made, but they're not necessarily the size you want. So these guys here are 16, 16. You have four of them. And they need to be put together because the mapping is not a one-to-one, -one, right? It's a square, and then the next pixel goes up, so you need a mapping function. That's what NeoMatrix does from uh, Adafruit. Uh, that's another thing Adafruit wrote, quite useful. Uh, you think, yeah, how hard can it be to map? But actually, with all the rotations, the way the serpentine, like the mapping can be like this. It could be a serpent one, and how you connect between the matrices. There's like a zillion ways of doing it, and the library does all the work, so that's quite well done. Um, then you can see, and it'll, well, I'll get back to it later. So then you have the RGB matrix panel, which these two guys are. Uh, those are newer versions of it. Again, I'm going quite fast. Uh, those are driven completely differently, but they have much higher density. Um, I was able to reuse my draw RGB that I had re uh, contributed for the IOTERS to actually put uh, random pix maps. And you can see those are completely different backends. This is a new pixel backend. This is a completely different driver but the same code. It's just using the same uh, you know, begin and everything else, the code does the same thing. That's really cool, actually. All right, so, um, yes, so I say, okay, well, no pixels. Maybe I could use them for something else and put them on my desk. So I go to events where being lit up is a good thing, uh, and I thought that was kind of made sense, actually. Uh, so not this kind of lit up, but this kind of lit up. Um, so that was without no pixels, that's just shining LEDs uh, that was version one, uh, and that, that worked, right? But you can do better than that. So uh, those uh, LED strips were all one color. They were not addressable LED by LED. I'm actually getting to the next talk, so I probably should be saving that for a second. Uh, let's go back to open hardware. Sorry, I got sidetracked. Uh, Lollibot was last year. So that was um, the one you just saw earlier. This little guy in MicroPython. Uh, I should have worked on it, and I was so busy doing my LED stuff that I didn't, but I did work on it during the conf, at least. Uh, so you saw this little guy. Okay, so that's, I think we're done for that part. So I'm done with the 20 minutes. I can go back to the pixels now, more or less. Um, okay, so is this the next talk? Yes. Sure. All right, so this is end of talk number one. Thank you.